how can the recent protests and repression in Hong Kong, the oppression of ethnic minorities in Xijing, and the celebrations of the 100th anniversary of the Chinese Communist Party be understood in relation to the power and governance in China through its reform era? By offering a tour of examples of Chinese state strategy solutions and citizen resistance in the past three decades, including her research on feminism and women's organizations, our guest, Dr. Sharon Wasoki, will explain Xi, Jing, Xi Jinping's role in relation to the wider evolution of the post mao Chinese authoritarianism herein from hunger strikes to lying flat, three decades of studying power and resistance in China. Hello and welcome to the Jefferson Educational Society's Digital Programming. I'm Ben Spagan. I'm the Vice President at the JES and I'm a Contributing Editor at the Erie Reader. Before we get to her presentation, a bit about the presenter. Sharon R. Wasoki uh, is, is the Arthur E. Braun Professor of Political Science at Allegheny College. A specialist in Chinese feminism and state society relations, she is the author of Chinese Feminism Faces Globalization, which came out in 2002. And she is also the co-editor of Not Just a Laughing Matter, Inter Interdisciplinary Approaches to Political Humor in China, which came out in 2017, as well as being the author of numerous journal articles and book chapters. She is currently at work on a translation of the work of Chinese feminist political theorist Song Xiaopeng, forthcoming in 2022. She received her undergraduate degree from Brandeis University and her PhD from Cornell University. For a full or much deserving bio, head over to our website, jeserie.org, or to Allegheny College's website, allegheny.edu. Folks, Dr. Wasoki will offer her insights and opening remarks and give a presentation. Then we're gonna open it up for discussion. There, we're going to work to work our way through as many questions from you, the viewers, as we can as we host this event live on the JES's Facebook page. If you have a question, just leave it in the comments section. And of course, if you're watching uh, or listening to a later broadcast of this program, still send us your questions, your comments to keep this conversation going. And of course, for more information about upcoming JES programs and publications, visit our website, jeserie.org, and be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Sharon Wasoki to the JES Digital Stage. Dr. Wasoki, thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us here. Thank you so much. It's really my pleasure to be here with you today, Ben. So thank you. Um, so I'll, I'll say at the start, my talk's a bit on the long side. Um, China's a little bit hard to capture in sound bites, even though we like to try <laughs> to do so. So um, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to give a broad tour of political development in China through um, some of my own research as well as, well as some current events. Um, like the ones that Ben mentioned. Um, the implicit question I'm gonna be thinking about through my talk really is what are the ways that political science grasps what is happening in China? How does this relate to policymaking as well as, as, well as to our own political understanding of China and our own political imagination? Um, and how can we understand continued spaces for resistance and personal autonomy, even as China turns ever more towards authoritarianism under Xi Jinping? So um, I have some slides to share. So um, <clears throat> 30 years ago this summer, I took my first trip to China. And these are pictures from it, the best quality ones I could get. Um, <laughs> um, China was still then in the throes of uncertainty after the events of 1989, about which I'll talk about briefly in a minute. But I still found it an amazing experience. Um, I went on a research trip with my own college professor. <sighs> Um, to rural Henan province where we visited villages where they hadn't seen foreigners since the Japanese passed through during World War II. Um, we rode, um, my co-researcher and I rode bumper cars in a small Chinese town that had an amusement park because it had made a lot of money through the oil business. Um, and the Chinese there didn't know you were supposed to bump into each other in bumper cars. They just thought you were supposed to politely drive around in circles because most of them had never driven cars before. So they were horrified that we were bumping into them. Um, and I started to learn about China at that time before I went to graduate school. Um, after June 4th, 1989, um, China's approach to its economy was not really clarified until 1992, um, when Deng Xiaoping clarified his commitment to what was then called market socialism. Um, but China's political fate, for some reason, still remained unclear. And it, there's important reasons for that. Um, China today, uh, 30 years later, features both the world's largest middle class and immense oppression, which political science has really long claimed should not necessarily go together. 
Um, among other things, this reveals the Western epistemological bias of political science, where basic questions and theoretical concepts are drawn largely from Western experience. So in 1989, when the students were protesting in Tiananmen Square, those of us that used to watch the nightly news when that was a thing might remember Dan Rather reporting from Tiananmen Square and enthusiastically talking about how the students were protesting for democracy and freedom. Um, in 1989, when the students in Tiananmen Square were protesting for democracy or freedom, there was a reflexive impulse here for us to think that that meant the same to them as it does to us. And, you know, it sort of does, and it sort of didn't. And um, so in, in short, when they were calling for democracy or freedom, it was not necessarily how we understand these concepts. So students were hunger striking for freedom, for example. Um, it may or may not have meant the same thing to us, to them as to us, the concept of freedom. Same with democracy. This was the statue of what was called the goddess of democracy, which was put up in the latter days of the protest. Democracy also might have meant different things. So after 1989, after the movement was violently suppressed, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a minute, um, 1989 was, of course, a really momentous year. The Berlin Wall collapsed later that fall. And so after that, a real burgeoning literature emerged to understand what happened in 1989, to relate it to the fall of the Berlin Wall, um, and to understand the emergence of civil society and the prospects for democratization in China. Um, this relates to a school of thought known as modernization theory, which was very prominent in sort of the 1950s, 1960s in the West, where theorists like Seymour Martin Lipset and Barrington Moore argued that um, basically that increasing wealth and increasing middle class led to democracy. So Barrington Moore kind of famously claimed in 1966, in his 1966 book, No Bourgeois, No Democracy. And by that, by bourgeois, he meant middle class. Um, these ideas can actually be traced all the way back to Aristotle, who wrote that some sort of middle class with political control could be the best guardian against ex excesses of rule by either the rich or the poor. Um, and more Contemporarily, um, arguments today are made that the middle class needs to be rebuilt to sustain democracies which are currently under stress around the world. So um, one link between um, the middle class and democracy is the concept of civil society. This is the idea that there's an autonomous sphere between the state and the, the private and, and the family, right, that allows for autonomous social organization. And really my early work in China emerged in this context at a time also when there was an interest in civil society in the United States. In 1995, um, Harvard political scientist Robert Putnam published his essay, later a book called Bowling Alone, which argued that civil society in America was in decline, that um, increasing social isolation led to decreasing social capital, which led to declining quality of democracy. And it's important to note that this was written 25 years ago, right before social media and its forms of isolation. So um, in China, after the violence of 1989, um, there actually was a brief pause and then um, Deng Xiaoping made what was known as, as his Nanshun, his tour of the South in um, 1992. And this was his indication that, that China was still gonna be very much open to, to market economics. And so we can see from this chart that uh, of China's GDP per capita growth that China's economy really started taking off in the middle 1990s and even more so in this millennium. Um, and this relates to Deng Xiaoping's, um, well, sorry, not yet, um, <clears throat> that there's a belief in political science that a market economy leads to changes um, in an economy that is state controlled, right? And that's, some of those changes are necessary, right? The release of totalitarian power that there were dimensions of totalitarian power under Mao Zedong, even if um, most scholars say it wasn't truly totalitarian at most, most moments. And so really the central tension in post-Mao China, and we still see that today, has been between some version of free market or capitalist economics and a continuing authoritarian one-party system of government under the Chinese Communist Party. Um, in the 1980s already, before Tiananmen Square protests, there were some hopes that China would open politically. And there were actual political reforms in China at this time. So it's popularly said that um, 
that you know in the 1980s ref, uh, Russia reformed politically under Gorbachev with, with with Glasnost and Perestroika, and China was reforming economically. And that's not really strictly true. China also had political reforms to eliminate the excesses of the Mao area era to provide more um, predictability and stability to the political system and to allow for more kind of competent, well-trained rulers. Um, but the Chinese Communist Party also often plainly stated its own continued authoritarian disposition. So um, this is Wei Jingsheng. Um, in the 1978 Democracy Wall Movement, he put up uh, a poster calling for the fifth modernization. At that time, Deng Xiaoping was calling for uh, four modernizations and he called for the fifth modernization of democracy. And for this gesture, he was imprisoned from 1979 to 1993. Um, in 1979, uh, alongside the early hits of reform, uh, Deng Xiaoping began to promote what he called his four cardinal principles. Um, this is a propaganda poster for one of them um, relating to the continued leadership of the Communist Party. So upholding the leadership of the Communist Party being an important principle that Deng Xiaoping promoted. And so in this context, the 1989 protests were a surprise. Um, they, they, they came on the heels of other protests during the 1980s, but um, those of us, many maybe here today, I don't know, who are too young <laughs> to remember these kind of six weeks of just exhilarating um, images coming out of China um, might remember these massive marches from the university district into central Beijing. Um, these are posters. So one of these posters says that, you know, they should be fighting for democracy and freedom. Um, there were massive sit-ins in Tiananmen Square, which lasted for weeks. Hunger strikes, like I said. Um, <clears throat> and it's important to note that the violent end of the protest was not necessarily inevitable. So soldiers were brought in about two weeks before the actual crackdown. And there was a standoff for, for, for two weeks between the soldiers and the protesters um, until finally violence erupted on the night of June 3rd into June 4th, um, leading to, to bloodshed. It's still not known how many people died. Most people died not in the square itself, but on the streets surrounding the square. Um, there's reports that people um, were surprised that live bullets were being used. Um, they did not expect this from the so-called People's Liberation Army. And um, there's a wonderful documentary about this, these events called Gate of Heavenly Peace that I highly recommend. It's on YouTube. It's like three hours long. So you might want to save it for a really cold, eerie winter night. But, um, but it's a really, really amazing um, chronicle of what happened. Um, and so um, <clears throat> the aftermath, we can see here, these are some really excellent, um, hard to find pictures of these events. Um, there was violence, right? There was, there was some fighting against the tanks that were brought in. Um, and then, um, but even, you know, the obvious violence of these events did not immediately change um, Western expectations of China. So um, the, the assumption that capitalism would inevitably lead to democracy continued to guide American policy towards China through the 1990s and into the 2000s. So um, the United States briefly sanctioned China after June 4th. Um, human rights became an ongoing um, item of concern in, in, in renewal of China's trade status prior to China's joining the World Trade Organization in 2001. Um, but pressures largely from American exporters with stakes in the China market led to the continuation of trade with China and the expansion of trade with China during the 1990s. Um, in 2001, um, China expert Kenneth Lieberthal, so a, a Chinese a, a political scientist, one of the leading experts on China, um, offered advice to the new administration of George W. Bush that, quote, market-based economic development and the associated formation of a middle class and increased integration with the outside world will, over the long run, produce liberalizing effects in China. So 20 years ago, there was still this idea that capitalism would lead to democracy in China. Meanwhile, in China, um, China was developing rapidly economically. This is a poster of one of Deng Xiaoping's most famous slogans, development is the only hard truth. And so this idea that economic development was the most important thing for China to pursue remained. And um, to really think about how important that is to China, we'd have to go all the way, way, way back in Chinese history to really understand that. But um, so much of my own research in China over the past three decades has been on various aspects of civil society and state society relations, right? How has this dynamic evolved between um, the Chinese party state and an evolving society in China with some increasing level of autonomy, certainly personal autonomy. 
um, <clears throat> really to look at how Chinese society relates to the state on the ground. Um, in the 1990s, my doctoral research was on the burgeoning sector of women's non-governmental organizations in Beijing. Um, what caused their emergence? What permitted their emergence? What functions did they serve? Um, this was a unique time in Chinese politics. Um, in September 1995, Beijing was the host of the United Nations Fourth, Fourth World Conference on Women and its accompanying NGO forum. And here's a photo of me there. I promise this. Well, okay, one more, there's one more photo of me in this slideshow. The rest are just stolen. Most of the images are just stolen from the internet. Um, uh, the party state um, regarded this event as a chance to show off its continued commitment to gender equality. Women's liberation has been an important part of um, Chinese Communist Party since it took power and even before. Um, it also wanted to demonstrate its ability to pull off a major international event because it was hoping to host the Olympic Games. Um, but the planning of the concurrent NGO forum presented the party state with a dilemma. You know, what are non-governmental organizations and how can they exist in the one party system? They really didn't even know what non-governmental organizations were when they started planning this event. Um, they resolved this dilemma through codifying the existence of a nascent, nascent already existing non-governmental women's organization sector. Um, and, and there were also NGOs emerging in other areas as well, like the environment and disability rights and social welfare and things like that. But the party continued to kind of wrestle with what this really meant. Um, they realized that the existence of NGOs might also mean the expression of discordant voices. So um, this NGO forum, which was supposed to be located in kind of central Beijing near the actual UN conference, at the last minute was moved to Huairo, a, dist a district some 30 miles away from central Beijing. There were, there were fears, they were like afraid that feminists would like march through Tiananmen Square with their tops off and all kinds of things like that. They didn't really understand how NGOs worked. Um, and so this kind of, we can start to see here the beginning of control of NGOs. Um, beginning in 1998, NGOs in China had to register with an appropriate state organization to be considered legal. And so we can see here the kind of ongoing negotiation that occurs between state and society, state and civil society in China. Deng Xiaoping had his four cardinal principles and um, Jiang, Jiang Zemin, who took power um, in 1989 and was in charge basically from 1989 to 2002, came up, his, his big theoretical contribution to Chinese communist ideology was, was what was called the three represents, um, among other things that meant that um, the Chinese Communist Party would represent the development trend of China's advanced productive forces, represent China's advanced culture, and represent the fundamental interests of the overwhelming majority of Chinese people. And this was mocked by some at the time, this idea of the three represents. But um, actually more recent observers have seen it as a really shrewd move by Jiang Zemin. What he was doing was he was welcoming capitalists into the Communist Party under the name of advanced productive forces. Um, Jiang was also fairly open towards the NGO sector. And so um, really for a decade or so after 1995, the women's NGO sector thrived. Um, doing projects on issues such as domestic violence, economic development, rural women's political participation. Um, this also, this is my last personal photo. This is a photo um, from around the time of the women's conference at the women's hotline in Beijing. Um, and the, uh, Betty Friedan um, was visiting, Betty Friedan who wrote The Feminine Mystique visited the women's hotline. That's her third from the right in the photo there next to the founder of the women's hotline, um, a, a wonderful lady named Wang Xingquan. So, um, there was a real interest in this in this NGO sector. There was obviously foreign interest in this NGO sector. Um, and what happened was that these NGOs managed to tow the party line. Um, and this is what I found in a lot of my research. They used the party's longstanding commitment to what was often called male female equality in Chinese to push on issues where women lagged or even had moved backwards um, under the economic reforms. And so, um, the party, the women's NGOs used the party's own commitment to women's equality to pressure the state on women's status. And so gender became an emergent sphere of um, critique of emergent inequalities under the reforms as inequality did start to emerge under the reforms. Um, to critique class inequality under the reforms would have been taboo. To say there were class inequalities in a communist country <laughs> would not have been too, too welcome. So gender sometimes substituted for class when talking about emergent inequality in China. Um, most of my research found that NGOs in their projects were especially accepted when they also served existing goals and needs of the party state. So when they filled in for a withdrawing welfare state, they would help with social welfare. 
Um, this is um, uh, uh, this is a woman named, obviously, meeting Hillary Clinton, a woman named Guo Jianmei, who founded a Women's Legal Aid Society in Beijing that got a lot of attention. Um, and um, so, there, and there were other times too. This is Hillary Clinton meeting when she was Secretary of State, meeting a set of Chinese women's organization leaders. Um, <clears throat> I think this is probably, this picture is probably 2009 or 2010. Um, <clears throat> meanwhile, and I, I guess I'll just quickly say that Guo Jianmei's organization was closed down in 2016 by the Xi Jinping government. Um, so there has been a clampdown on civil society under Xi Jinping. Um, meanwhile, in the um, 1990s, China became richer, and in the 2000s, it became even richer. So this is, um, again, if we're talking about the middle class having an influence on the size of, or, or an influence on democ democratization, we can see the amazing growth of the middle class in China in these years, from a share of 3% to over half the population in, in 2000, 3% 2000, to over half the population by 2018. Um, Russia's also had growth. Um, here, it's important to note that middle class, this is a global definition of middle class, is people spending 10 to $50 per day. So to be clear, this means that almost half of China's population um, was low income, spending 2 to $10 per day. So China still has a very large poor population. In World Bank terms, China is an upper middle income country with a gross national income per capita of uh, that, that category is $4,000 to $12,500. Um, in nominal terms, China's GDP per capita is now about $10,000 per year. But China, um, along with other post-communist countries, is defying the predictions that a middle class will lead to increased interest in or even demands for democratization. Research scholarship shows that middle classes in China and also Russia, I'm not as familiar with the scholarship on Russia, but that middle classes in China and Russia are dependent on the state. And that dependence combined with their improved socioeconomic well-being leads to them supporting the state as well as being less supportive of democratic values. And I just wanna briefly note that um, China has of course an elaborate internet and media censorship regime, but the Chinese middle class are not necessarily just duped or brainwashed, right? They, they, are, they have received benefits. The improvement in living standards in China over the past two or three decades is stunning. Um, and so this really leads us to the current context and um, Xi Jinping. Um, understanding Xi Jinping um, and his increased um, authoritarian bent. Um, <clears throat> this is a, a poster of Xi Jinping and his wife, um, Peng Li Yuan, who's a very famous Chinese folk singer. Um, Xi Jinping is, emphasizes um, his goal is what is called the China dream. So this poster uh, refers to the China dream, a strong China, dream of a strong China. Um, he emphasizes comprehensive national security as a major goal of the regime. It's evident, was already evident in, on June 4th, 1989, that the CCP was willing to violently respond to threats to its authority. And this remained clear even before Xi Jinping came to power. And so, in certain ways, Xi Jinping is a change in degree, in degree, not in kind from his predecessors. A lot of people are saying, oh my gosh, he's so authoritarian. And it's true that there were um, some more aspects of China that were more open, but it's also important to note that he's not a total change. Some of his biggest changes are the way, um, the kind of culture personality that's sprung up around him. So this was a song that was popular for a while on the Chinese internet. This was just a screen capture that Si da da ai pang mama, you know, si, um, they call him si da da, daddy si or uncle si, and he, he loves his wife. Um, uh, and this is, this is an incredibly interesting poster. Um, this is the um, uh, great leader, uh, Chairman Xi Jinping. And the terms for leader is very interesting here. It's Ling, Ling Xiu, which um, is a term for the leader that has not been used basically since um, Mao Zedong's immediate successor, Hua Guofeng, for, who was briefly in power after Mao died in 1976. It's, it's a term for leader that's like even higher than the typical leader used in China, which is Ling Dao. And then also calling him Zhu Xi, um, Chairman Xi, which is a, chair, a term that has not been used um, for a Chinese leader since, since, since Mao. So this poster is kind of already indicating, th th this poster was dated 2014, these terms I suppose they weren't started to be used by for seats until around 2018, but in any event, there's this emergent Xi Jinping cult. Um, he also, of course, eliminated term limits. So next year it is, is, is 
assumed that he will um, be approved for his third term in office after term limits had been approved or um, followed by previ previous leaders, Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao, who each um, limited themselves to two five-year term limits and then stepped down. Um, aspect of censorship. So for a while and still possibly in China, I just, I'm showing these because I find them um, entertaining. Um, Winnie the Pooh was banned in China because there was an emergent series of memes on the Chinese internet comparing Xi Jinping to Winnie the Pooh. And um, partially I just like this because it shows the kind of, um, the sense of humor and creativity of Chinese netizens. So there's this one and then um, this one. <laughs> and then um, I, I really, really like this one that's uh, former Ch Japanese prime minister Shinzo Abe, um, <laughs> people seeing the resemblance. And so um, I'm gonna briefly talk now about you know recent news that is un unfortunately much less amusing than these memes. I'll briefly talk about um, Xinjiang, um, Hong Kong, the CCP's 100th anniversary, and then I'm going to talk about this phenomenon called lying flat, Tangping, which has been the summer's internet sensation in China to some extent. So um, I'll start with Xinjiang. Um, Xinjiang is sometimes called China's second Tibet. And this map starts to show us why Xinjiang is, is important to China and why Xinjiang is a problem for China. This is an ethnic map of China. And so um, the blue on the right is what is sometimes called, and I could show you a provincial map as well, but I won't, um, you can look one up yourself, um, it is um, what's called China proper, where the dominant Han ethnicity um, primarily lives. The Han are about 92% of China's population. So we can see that the Han occupy, you know, only about half of China's land mass and are 92% of the population. And so other parts, the um, bottom right is Tibet and the, the top left, the far Northwest of China is Xinjiang. Um, and so um, Xinjiang is the most sparsely populated province in China. It contains mineral and agricultural resources. It's an incredibly sensitive border area, including a teeny tiny border with Afghanistan, which of course has been in the news a whole hell of a lot the last few days. Um, and so um, Xinjiang was fully conquered by the Qing dynasty, the last dynasty in 1884. Um, in Chinese, the name Xinjiang, um, and that in 1884 was when it was given the name Xinjiang. Um, the name Xinjiang in Chinese means new frontier. And so we can start to see um, actually what, what, how Chinese people understand these territories. Incidentally, uh, the Chinese name for uh, Tibet, Xizang, means Western storehouse or Western treasure house. Um, and so since then, um, you know, Xinjiang has been technically under the leadership of the party. It tried to declare its independence. But um, it's now referred to as the uh, Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. Um, but actually Han Chinese hold all the top leadership positions. You cannot become um, a member of the Chinese Communist Party unless you're willing to declare that you're an atheist, which presents great difficulties for the Muslims of Xinjiang as well as the Buddhists of Tibet. And the CCP has promoted development in Xinjiang, um, in including the cotton, um, and cotton and oil industries. Um, there have been a number of independence movements in the region, which has led to China labeling Xinjiang as a terrorist threat, right? These, these pro-independence movements. Um, I, there's a lot more detail that I could go into here, but I'm, I'll try to keep it brief. Um, so it, it, particularly after September 11th, 2001, um, China has labeled the Xinjiang separatist movement as a terrorist movement. And that's, this has continued and accelerated under Xi Jinping. So under Xi Jinping, um, starting in 2017, laws banning extremism were instituted province-wide. Um, these laws include banning what were called abnormal beards, the public wearing of veils, um, people who refused to watch state television were critiqued. Um, and parents were you know, enc encouraged to educate their children to oppose extremism. This is a propaganda poster from the time. It's pretty interesting, actually. The book they are studying is China's criminal law. So this idea that they should study China's criminal law. Um, people have probably heard about the so-called re-education camps um, in Xinjiang. It's estimated that one half to one million people have been placed in these so-called re-education camps. Um, religious and cultural practices have been greatly restricted. So Qurans and other religious items have been confiscated, mosques have been destroyed. This has been justified as a crackdown on terrorism and to weed out ethnic separatists. The idea of stability maintenance is very important to the Chinese government. They also see it as um, I, an idea of economic development versus backwardness. 
So this ongoing crackdown is this idea that China is, is going to lead Xinjiang into modernity, um, which is of course actually some commentators say an incredibly um, colonialist notion. This also relates, and um, this will also be relevant to Hong Kong, to what the evolving meaning of what it means to be Chinese. Um, and so um, in 2020, Xi Jinping said that every ethnic group of Xinjiang is a family member linked to Chinese, Zhonghua, bloodlines. And so this is a real shift from a kind of a melting pot model of China, of multi multiculturalism that China, um, to it from a kind of a, this idea actually, excuse me, that China has a kind of melting pot idea of multiculturalism, right? That, that, um, that all people are gonna be unified into some sort of unified Chinese bloodline. And so this is why um, some refer to what's happening in Xinjiang as a genocide. Um, and I won't here go into details on how um, genocide is defined by the United Nations, but um, one Chinese Xinjiang re-education re document said that the intention was to break their lineage, break their roots, break their connections and break their origins. So really breaking channels of cultural transmission from generation to generation. Um, at a time when there's increasing attention in this country to the history of residential boarding schools for Native Americans and in Canada as well, China is now placing ch uh, Uyghur children, uh, children in Xinjiang, Muslim children in boarding schools or orphanages, separating them from their parents and forcibly educating them in Chinese language. There's birth suppression policies, forced IUDs in the camps, and like I said, a bunch of um, crackdowns on religious practices. So to move on to Hong Kong, <clears throat> it's important to note that um, Hong Kong was never fully a democracy. It was, it's kind of, it was a colony under the Brit British. And then under China, after it was handed back over in 1997, we could say that it's basically a semi-colony and it was a semi-democracy until last year. There are elections in Hong Kong um, of the chief executive and the legislative council, but these are basically, um, the LegCo is only elected half by um, one person, one vote. And so in ongoing protests in Hong Kong, one call has often been for, for what they call universal suffrage, which is genuine one person, one vote. Um, and it's funny because, um, and the chief executive, one more Winnie the Pumim, uh, the current chief executive is, is Carrie Lam. Um, she is elected by, from a very restricted pool of candidates and then um, a, a chosen basically by an electoral college that's approved by Beijing. So the surprising thing about Hong Kong is that it was long seen as a politically apathetic business hub, but really since the turnover and, and since the early 2000s, there have been ongoing protests in Hong Kong. Calls for universal suffrage, um, protests against what's seen as mainland interference in Hong Kong government, um, and so this really led to the protests that started in, in 2019 over a proposed extradition bill. Um, and these protests went on for months, um, even when COVID was in full force. Um, and just amazing demonstrations, you know, million, you know, a, a million or more Hong Kongers of, of a territory of a population of about 7 million, you know, going into the streets on a, on a, on a pretty regular basis. And so last summer, um, Beijing passed a national security law for Hong Kong. And it's important to note that Hong Kong has long been supposed to have such a law. It's part of Hong Kong's basic law. It's mini constitution that it should be, have a security law, but it's never passed. And so finally Beijing just forced this law and it criminalizes a number of things, including um, secession, subversion, terrorism, and collusion with foreign forces. Beijing said it did this to return stability to the territory. And so, um, this isn't actually an Allegheny photo from 2009 when I took a group of students to China and Hong Kong. We were there on June 4th for the 20th anniversary of the Tiananmen Square. And in Hong Kong, they still had vigils every year to mark the anniversary. And so our students were able to attend this vigil. Um, this is Victoria Park that's in the same venue um, just this past summer on June 4th. The vigil was banned and, and the park was, was patrolled by police to make sure that <clears throat> nobody did anything they shouldn't do. There have been over a hundred arrests under the national security law in its first year. Um, there have been arrests for basic political rights, such as um, free expression under charges of sedi seditious or secessionist speech. Um, so uh, 
we can see here um, a warning under the law that people might get arrested if they chant slogans or conduct themselves with an intent such as secession. Um, just on July 27th last month, a court in Hong Kong convicted a 24 year old waiter of terrorism and inciting secession, the first person to be convicted under this law, he may face life in prison. Um, they've criminalized the major slogan from the protest, which is here it's translated free Hong Kong revolution. Now it's usually translated as um, liberate Hong Kong revolution of our times. Um, and so the effect on the city has been very harsh. Um, many organizations have closed down just in the last couple of weeks. The teachers union was disbanded. Um, civil servants have to swear an oath of loyalty to China. Hong Kong police are being trained as GUSTEP, like the Chinese military. And there's just many, many other aspects. Um, people, there's a view that the electoral system has to allow primarily an emphasis on patriots running for election, i.e. people that are pro-China. And this, this I, I wanna note that this is referred to as Beijing as perfecting Hong Kong's electoral system. This is how they refer to these changes in the Hong Kong electoral system. This is important in relation to questions of identity. Um, in recent surveys, um, nearly 60% of Hong Kongers aged 18 to 30 said they would leave Hong Kong if they could. Um, and there's an increasingly separate Hong Kong identity as we can see from this chart, right? It used to be that um, Hong Kongers identified, more Hong Kongers at least identified as Chinese or even citizens of the PRC possibly. And now they really increasingly identify as Hong Kongers. And um, just similar trends just incidentally can also be seen in Taiwan. If we think about questions of whether people in Taiwan identify as Chinese or Taiwanese, they increasingly identify as Taiwanese. And so the 100th anniversary of the Chinese Communist Party, um, some people here might've read or heard about aspects of Xi Jinping's speech on the occasion where he wrote, um, where he said, um, China's success hinges on the party. And the most quoted um, uh, moment of the speech was when he said, the Chinese people will never allow any foreign force to bully, oppress, or subjugate us. Anyone who would attempt to do so will find themselves on a collision course with a great wall of steel forged by over 1.4 billion Chinese people. And it's important to note that's kind of a, an official translation on a collision course, the um, the phrase actually means finding your head blashed, bashed bloody. So finding your head blashed buddy, bloody on a great wall of steel. So some kind of violent imagery there from Winnie the Pooh. Um, uh, I, I, if anybody is on Twitter, I recommend this Twitter account. It's Xi Jinping looking at things. It's got some really funny um, sort of aspects of Xi Jinping. So including this one, Xi Jinping waving to Xi Jinping. Um, the, um, the term Great Wall of Steel used by Xi Jinping in the speech is really important to note. It's, it's been used before. Um, in a 2017 policy document on, on Xinjiang, um, they said they were going to build a Great Wall of Steel to allow people of all ethnic groups to jointly safeguard the unity of the mother, motherland, ethnic solidarity, and social stability. <clears throat> And so just to return to thinking about civil society and resistance in China today, why this apparent doubling down on authoritarianism? Um, some scholars, including uh, CSIS's Jude Blanchett, argue that Xi Jinping believes he has a very narrow time window of frankly, relative weakness of the United States um, and of Russia to um, full, more fully assert China's global power and role, and also to deal with some of China's internal problems. The leadership in China has absolute disdain for what happened that led to the collapse of the Soviet Union, and they do not want to see that happen in China. Um, China has many internal problems, including, and this is all during Xi Jinping's rule, increasing inequality. Um, there remains corruption, although Xi Jinping has famously launched crackdowns on corruption. Economic growth is slowing. Um, anybody who reads um, news about China has probably read about China's concerns about declining fertility and the recent end of the one child policy and actually allowing and even encouraging people to have up to three children now. Um, and so really despite China's amazing economic growth um, for, the past, um, for the past three decades, life there remains challenging, including for young people. Nearly half of China's population continues to make less than $150 a month. And um, 
concern about a coming later shortage has not really changed access to meaningful work. And so this summer, so um, there's a real, um, there, there's a problem with inadequate work in China um, because of the large population. There's also um, um, ironically a problem of overwork, which perhaps we might recognize in America as well, right? People that are unemployed or underemployed and then people who work too hard. Um, and so this summer, a really hot topic emerged on the internet, and that is the topic of what's called tangping, or lying flat, translated as lying flat. Um, it started with a factory worker named Luo Huazhong, who quit his job to just cycle around China. And he wrote a viral blog post titled Lying Flat is Justice, and it included this picture of him just laying in a bed. Um, he later said, do we have to work 12 hours a day in a sweatshop, and is that justice? Um, and after he quit his job, notably to, um, to sort of support himself, he took various jobs, including once playing a corpse in a film, clearly something he was very qualified to do. Um, and so um, young people in China, and again, it's really not clear how many, it's probably a very small number of people, are tired of what's the, the so-called 996 work culture. Um, the 996 work culture is working from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. six days per week. Um, this has been advocated by certain um, people in China, including um, the founder of Alibaba, which is China's Amazon, Jack Ma, who once called the 996 work culture a huge blessing for the tech industry. And so social media posts started emerging and memes started emerging um, just for working minimally. Um, <clears throat> one member of an online Tangping group said, according to the mainstream standard, a decent lifestyle must include working hard, trying to get good results on work evaluations, striving to buy a home and a car, and making babies. However, I loaf around on the job whenever I can, refusing to work overtime, not worrying about promotions, and not participating in corporate drama. And so this was a real emphasis on uh, hard work and consumerism that have really been promoted by the state as a kind of substitute for ideological or moral meaning. It's also related to a phenomenon that's emerged in China called neijuan, which means um, involution. Um, this, which basically means you keep working harder and harder and harder, but you don't really make any progress. And um, I think two years ago, this photo went viral. It's at Tsinghua University in Beijing, um, which is kind of known as China's MIT. And it was this kid like working on his laptop while he was riding his bike. And he was called the king of the king of involution, the king of Neijuan. Unsurprisingly, this has been not responded to very positively by the state. President Xi has said that the new era belongs only to those who work hard and happiness can only be achieved through great endeavors. And actually struggle is a big term that's used in China these days, fundo, struggle. Um, I used to joke, I was um, in Beijing on a sabbatical two years ago in the fall of 2019 and my research assistant and I used to joke about fundo a lot. Let's go fundo for our dinner and things like that because struggle is a big theme. Um, it's really can be seen as a form of resistance to the idea of that there's not a lot of upward mobility in China, actually, even after all of its progress. And the idea that young people will have to struggle their whole lives to find anything resembling a middle class existence. So in Beijing, for example, the average apartment costs over 300,000 US dollars, over two, 2 million yuan. Um, but about half of people in China still only make about 1,000 yuan per month. So uh, the average, you know, so many, many people in China would need to work for over a hundred years just to be able to afford an apartment in Beijing, a basic apartment. Um, <clears throat> so Tongping um, is a way of responding to this, just of giving up to some extent. Um, a song came out on the Chinese internet, which was briefly um, up and then it was censored. This is, uh, Tongping is the benevolent way, the kingly way. This is an archaic Chinese phrase inspired by Taoism. Um, and I'll refer to this again at the end. There's a lot of beloved classical Chinese poetry written by and about exiled, disillusioned government officials. This was written by a guy who quit his job in advertising. <laughs> um, there's pressure to reproduce. Um, one social media post said, we are all thinking about how best to lie down while they are pushing us to reproduce. State media responded with censorship of this, calling Tangping shameful. Um, closing online forums about Tangping. Um, they stopped e-commerce platforms from selling Tangping branded products like t-shirts and things like that. There were also some negative responses on social media. 
if everyone lies flat, who will protect the country? Who will reverse the course of COVID? Who will explore Mars? Who will deliver your takeout? One person wrote. And I just, I guess I'd like to conclude um, by really thinking about Tangping as an ongoing source of resistance. And this is particularly um, evident when you look at what people have said about it. Um, the way that Tangping reveals continued discontent in China and the ways that people can talk about it. Um, so these are two other internet memes. These are more about the, the Neijuan culture, the hard work culture, but um, the one on the left, you know, you can see it's a dog. <laughs> and he says, I'm not a lazy person. I need a work sister. And then the other one, this cat smoking a cigarette, fixing a car, says, um, there is no hard work. There, is, there, are, there are only workers who dare to do things, basically, is, is how these, um, these two memes. And they're mocking, right, this idea that people should just work really hard their whole lives. Um, and so one um, really interesting response to this was um, uh, public intellectual and Tsinghua University professor Sun Li Ping, a sociologist, published an essay on his WeChat feed arguing that Tangping is related to the pheno phenomenon of, quote, having had hope at one point, as well as the destruction of that hope and the in inability to get it back. Um, the idea is to understand why they are laying flat. And this, the responses of this are so, in to this are so interesting. Um, some of which they increased, uh, critique the rapid increase in the pace of life in China. Some of them put it in the context of reducing blind, blind obedience to the idea of consumerism in China. Um, some of them talked about um, young people just resisting to be able to choose their own kind of freedom. Um, and um, one comment noted, they monopolized all the power and seized all the resources. What are we to do if not lie flat? So this idea, this real sort of kind of incipient, incipient kind of anger. And um, other commentaries um, have placed Tangping in relation to Chinese history and culture, such as Taoism and its philosophy of Wu Wei or not doing things. Um, and the great fourth and fifth century Chinese poet Tao Yuanming, who's considered the grandfather of the great poets of the Tang dynasty some three centuries later, who was himself a person who served in the government and then left that life as to, to live as a rural recluse. And I'll just I'll actually close my talk here by quoting from one of his poems, because I love classical Chinese poetry. His, um, this is a poem of Tao Yuanming, written around the year 400, <laughs> called Home Again Among Garden and Fields. Um, it's translated by David Hinton. This is just a part of it. Um, Nothing like the others, even as a child, rooted in a love for hills and mountains, I fell into their net of dust, that one departure of blunder lasting 13 years. But a tethered bird longs for its forest, a pond fish its deep waters. So now my land out on the south edge cleared, I nurture simplicity among gardens and fields. Um, thank you so much, I'll stop there. Dr. Sharon Wasoki, oh, wow. The amount of <laughs> material and history covered uh, there in in un, under an hour, uh, under 50 minutes. Uh, thank you for sharing all of that. And I, I think that as you started it, one of the things I think of is is perhaps our, and I say our of uh, perhaps Western civilization at large, our lack of understanding or lack of clarity uh, about political development happening in um, in China in particular. Looking at it, all the things that you covered in, in, in taking us through the history, if we had to ask you, and a big question here, but if we had to ask you what the most pressing concern to the Chinese people is today, I, I'd be curious to, to hear your answer, what they're most worried about today. And then if I had to press you just a little bit further, I'd say, what do you think that's going to be a year from now, long term, what the most pressing concerns might be for the Chinese people? Um, I mean, I guess I'll just say that, um, so <clears throat> 20, over 20 years ago, when I started teaching Chinese politics at Allegheny. Um, my first Chinese politics class, my students, they thought China was a rich country 20 years ago already, because we have this rhetoric, right, in this country of China's economy being so large and powerful. Um, and that's, you know, China is much richer now than it was even 20 years ago, and people's lives are much better. But I would say their main concerns are daily life, um, affording, because there are many things that are, there's, it's incredibly competitive society, 
because partially because it's so unequal. And so there's concerns about there's children's schooling, about affording an apartment. Um, certainly there is a middle class that does, you know, take trips, you know, there's more travel and things like that. But I would just say really um, figuring out how to navigate daily life. I, I do think there is some political concern, but I would say that we, that mostly, you know, when there's, there's surveying done, Chinese popular opinion is actually the opposite of uh, American popular opinion. Um, and this has been long true, even in Chinese history, that um, they tend to approve of the central government and not like they're often disapprove of their local officials. And oftentimes it's reversed in the US. Americans hate, you know, Congress, right? Uh, you know, there's all these stats that we hate Congress more than cockroaches and stuff like that, which I can't even understand because who likes cockroaches? But <laughs> but um, I don't know, I don't know if that's true or not, but um, so, uh, and we like our local officials and it's the opposite in China. And that's long been true um, in China. You know, people identify their local officials as the sources of their problems. Um, and so, you know, to, the, the central government even now um, is not as unpopular as we might think. And in fact, um, you know, Chinese people, and I, again, it's very, I don't like to generalize about Chinese people, it's very hard, but they are rightfully proud of the accomplishments of their country over the last 30 or 40 years. Um, and I, as somebody who's been going to China for 30 years now, I can tell you the the development is absolutely stunning. I mean, it is is it is unrecognizable now from what it looked like 30 years ago. Um, and many people's lives have improved. And so they see that daily improvement, you know, it's very tangible to them, the improvement in their daily lives. I hope that answers the question. It, it, it does. Um, I, yeah. I, I think I think what um, what, what I've heard uh, James Fallows from the Atlantic say before, mm -hmm. uh, who spent time in yeah. China, is yes, that yeah, he's, United, a, he's a great writer. With with the United States, the the farther away you are from it, looking at it, you think it's quite messy. But the closer you get to the ground level, it seems to make sense. It's working, and it seems to be inverted in in China. The farther away, and I think that's the structure yeah. of uh, the yeah. larger government yeah. down to the local yeah. government. From what I hear you saying. A question we have from our audience, I'm going to turn to a question here. Great. You were touching on freedom and democracy and what they meant to the Chinese people in, in uh, 1989 with Tiananmen Square and how perhaps we do misunderstand what freedom and democracy mean to them. Uh, I want to ask to go a little deeper on that because that person's asking you to unpack that. And I guess if I can, if I can add on the meanings of freedom and democracy today, how have they evolved for the Chinese people since 1989? If you can recap that for us again. Yeah. Sure. Um, so in 1989, um, the, the, the movement, you know, was largely led by, by college students. And so when they were talking about freedom and democracy, oftentimes they were referring more to them having more of an influence on the government <laughs> rather than China suddenly having like everybody getting to vote. <laughs> um, and there kind of emerged some splits in the 1989 movement. Um, there are a lot of workers started to participate. Um, and a, a lot of the students weren't, weren't always, they didn't always treat the workers particularly well. Um, and there was, there, was, there was coalitions and alliances as well, but also, you know, tension. Um, and so that's one example, I think, of how that operated um, in 1989. So today, <laughs> um, today, you know, Xi Jinping himself talks about democracy. So there are these, what are called the core socialist values of Xi Jinping right now under, there, there's 12 of them. Um, national, I think, social and individual levels. Um, democracy is one of them, or, you know, the word, the Chinese word for democracy is one of them. Um, to some extent in China, what that means is, is better governance, more efficient governance. And so, uh, you know, what you said about James Fallows was interesting because, you know, China is a society that works pretty well in a lot of ways. The government works, it's efficient, you know, it, it gets stuff done. Um, and partially that's because it's authoritarian, but partially because there are, you know, China has a, you know, one thing that Chairman Mao did, for example, is he, you know, made the country very literate, fairly well educated. And so um, the government is effective. And so for them, it's more about um, government, government working. And I think it also for Xi Jinping now, he's just in the last few days started talking about what he calls common prosperity. He's starting to sort of take on this concern for inequality. Um, and so this idea that, you know, perhaps growth should be more quality growth, 
um, most people are familiar with, at least on some level, with the environmental degradation in China that's occurred in, in the reforms. And um, you know, freedom is an interesting concept in China as well. This may be a sensitive topic, but um, I believe it was last summer um, when we were really starting to lock down from COVID. China was open because they had an incredibly draconian response to the virus when it first emerged there. They had mass, and they still do, right? They, I have a friend in China who just messaged me. This is weeks ago. This is before Delta. This is and maybe even, I, I can't remember when this was. It's a while ago. She's like, oh, somebody tested positive in my apartment. So we all have to quarantine for three weeks, you know, <laughs> in my, and she lives in a huge apartment building like they live in in China. Um, and so these draconian crackdowns. And so what happened last summer was China was normal while we were locked down and masking and testing. China had at that point largely eliminated the virus and people were living their lives normally. And they were like, hey, who's more free now? <laughs> their idea of freedom was living a normal life um, because they had put the virus in control. So I don't know if that helps. I mean, I guess one other concept I would talk about is the concept of, of rights. It, you know, China, there's um, there's been this crackdown, which has also received a lot of um, attention recently on the tech industry in China. And one of the rationales for that has to do with protecting people's privacy rights. Um, the thing is that privacy means something different in China than it means here. Here, it's like we don't want people having access, among other things, to like our personal, you know, information, our address, our email, all that stuff. In China, it's more about shameful things like photographs that you don't want people to see and things like that. So um, there's the concepts exist in China, but oftentimes they have a different kind of flavor to them, I guess, I would say, if that makes sense. It, yeah, it, it does. And um, so I think I'd be remiss if I didn't ask or come back to yeah, Xi Jinping, sure. the point that you mentioned, he's eliminated uh, term limits. Uh, so we, we assume we're going to see him a while. Uh, if, if you're the physician and I'm asking you to do a pulse check, uh, because here in the United States, we have a new president. And if we're doing a pulse check now on U.S.-China relations, uh, what would you say we're reading? And then if I asked you to go back to January of 2021 to do the pulse check, what was it then? Are things changing? Uh, can we get a pulse check on U.S.-China relations? Um, actually, I would say that probably one of the maybe in some ways, I mean, some of the rhetoric has changed, but one of the bigger continuities between the Trump administration and the Biden administration is relations with China. Both Trump and Biden are, um, was and are positing China as, a, as an adversary. Um, and there are very good reasons to do that. And I want to be very clear, um, and I, I hope this was sort of clear in my talk, Xi Jinping is more authoritarian than Hu Jintao or Jiang Zemin, right? Like civil society has been clamped down under Xi Jinping. Uh, there's less I mean, there's never been free expression in China, but there's even less latitude for expression of things in China. Um, China is more authoritarian now. And so his, um, you know, eliminating term limits on himself is, is, is a bad thing. <laughs> um, uh, US-China relations, to be totally honest with you, I, I have never seen them this bad. Um, and I um, I'm very concerned, honestly. I personally, I don't know when I will go back to China and that's partially because of COVID and it's partially because it's increasingly um, unsafe for foreigners, particularly people doing research to go there. Um, I'm not sure I will, I will ever go there to do research again at this point, um, which is something I, I grieve a lot. Actually, I would not, I don't think people, it's always hard to get Chinese people to talk to you. I think now it would be even considerably harder um, and I would not want to put people at risk. Uh, most of my interview, most of my research has been interview research. So, um, so yeah. And I, I think you know this idea of a cold war. I really, um, I was listening to a podcast recently that talked about this idea of a cold war between the United States and China, and it defined a cold war as like um, the the operational logic of a, an entire country's kind of policy is based on its adversarial relationship with the other side, right? So if we think of the US Soviet Union Cold War, right? That was how everything, how everything operated then. Um, I, I hope that doesn't happen with respect to China. I think that there's still space for cooperation. We're having some productive conversations about climate change, for example. Um, and, I, and China is you know, much more integrated in the global economy than the Soviet Union was. Um, but I, I don't, I, I'm very, I'm very, concerned about US-China relations. I mean, I think there's good reasons to, to be, be um, 
hard with China, but um, but also we have to, unfortunately, for better or worse. I think of China actually our relationship with China as being like a marriage. We're kind of stuck with each other, <laughs> and um, <laughs> and it's you know not really really been a very happy marriage most of the time. Um, but you know when you think about being married to somebody. Um, I've been married for almost 25 years. Um, you know, it's better to try to like get along with the person you're married to and treat them well rather than 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 treating them badly. Um, us shaming China is is not going to do anything but cause China to become more intransigent in certain ways. So that's one example of of that, I would say. I feel like that's a topic we could dive into <laughs> for much, much longer, but I know we're almost out of time here. And, and I, have, I have two final questions okay. and, and one I'll, I'll tell you will be the final question I'll ask you. Okay. What drew you to China to begin with? I oh. want to come back to that and ask you that <laughs> at the end, because I wanted to go to another audience question. Uh, and the person's okay. asking, it, 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 what does the clampdown look like in terms of the reaction from the Chinese people? Because you talked about uh, lying flat and many other things. So what does the reaction look like? But more importantly, is there a breaking point at which people will not be clamped down upon any further? Um, I mean, it definitely, I would say the clamp down there, I mean, I mostly talk to, you know, the, and this is a kind of a flaw in my research, but it's pretty common, you know, I mostly talk to pretty privileged people. And so, you know, well-educated people, urban people, um, you know, a lot of them are very unhappy with what's happening, you know, in terms of even less access to, to um, sort of forms of expression, more control. There's all kinds of ideological study sessions that go on in schools and stuff that kind of didn't happen before that they have to do. Um, and, you know, they can't even make fun of them anymore. They used to do them and like make fun of them and get away with that. And now you can't do that. Um, so there's definitely a, like a dissatisfaction with that. Um, in terms of limits, you know, I think that um, there, there's a school of thought, um, uh, you know, could be that could be called collapsism among uh, certain people who look who who watch China. There's one guy in particular who's notorious. I won't even name because I don't find his work to be very useful. Um, I, I I think that. Um, that is a mistaken way to think about China. I don't. I don't think they're anywhere near a breaking point, honestly. Um, both because people's lives remain much better than they were in the past, right? And because there is an incredible amount of control in China. Um, and so, um, I hope. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I think. I think the person maybe. Or maybe I'm. I'm assuming mm. for the person, the wondering is when might we see hunger strikes or protests largely again in the streets? Um, you know, as we might. You know, we saw in the past. You know, would there be a breaking point with the clamp down on uh, civil society and and culture? Just wondering. And it is. It appears we're not there yet. You know. No, and I mean, I there's even let you know under Hu Jintao and stuff. There was some space for some like labor strikes. Um, you know, there were there there were periods of labor strikes in China, especially in, in southeastern China. Um, some occasional small scale street protests. Um, that is that is gone. And I guess I will say that um, some scholars now are, have been writing about how there still is, is actually some space for protest and resistance in China. There's organized channels, right? So China's instituted things called like e-government where you can like write to your officials and, and they're somewhat responsive, I guess. So there still are, you know, that's kind of how it happens rather than people marching in the streets. Um, China is incredibly the government in China. And I, I actually, let me say this also because I had it in my talk, but I don't think I said it. China spends more on internal security than it spends on its defense budget. And China's defense budget is the second largest defense budget in the world after the United States. So they, they, they are very concerned about internal security. They have an incredibly large army of domestic security personnel, you know, internet sensors, um, all kinds of stuff like that. And so one of the things that internet censorship has focused on for quite a long time now is clamping down on any possible protests, 
Like that's always what they're focused on. So the things I, I just cited at the end about the, the lying flat, you know, people expressing things on the internet, what they're saying is interesting and they kind of still even get away with that to a point because it's not organized. When they really get concerned about internet expression is when people start to organize. And so, um, and that's partially because they are really afraid of what they call color revolutions. There are all this series of revolutions in former Soviet republics, like the Rose Revolution and the Orange Revolution. They, they are like dead set against China ever having a color revolution. And so, um, and the Arab Spring also freaked them out a lot. And so those sorts of things mean that that is what they are laser focused on not happening. So that final question, what drew you to China initially? And I'll, I'll add to it, what keeps you interested in China today? Um, okay, I'll just be really personal, I guess. Um, and uh, I was in college in the late 1980s. China was just kind of starting to emerge. Um, I actually had this idea that I could study an Asian language and maybe make money. <laughs> and now I'm a professor at Allegheny College, so you can see how well that went. Um, uh, and I took Chinese. That was the only language that was offered at my undergraduate institution when I started. And I actually got good grades in it and I enjoyed it. Um, and um, it's funny, I, I went to graduate school without having to study China without having yet visited China before. I remember going to visit my graduate advisor at Cornell and she's like, oh, good luck. <laughs> mm. And so um, I was supposed to go to China the summer of 1989, um, which was the summer. Um, before my junior year in college. And then the protests happened and nobody was going to China that summer. So, so those protests are very like, I, I was a very avid watcher of those protests and I wrote my graduate undergraduate thesis about them. Um, and so, and then I've, I've actually been going there ever since almost yearly, not quite, but, um, and I really, um, I'm very, I love China. I do, I, um, it's sometimes a love hate relationship, but I, have made wonderful friendships there. And I actually often tell my students who I'm trying to encourage to study Chinese that um, other than marrying my husband, studying Chinese is probably the second best decision I've ever made in my life. So um, what keeps me going there is, is just friend, friends and it's never boring because there's so many things to study. It's kind of overwhelming sometimes actually. And um, also the, I'll just say the food is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nothing like the Chinese food here and it is fantastic. Julia Child once said she could eat in China forever and never get tired of the food. So I miss the food terribly right now. Yes. <laughs> well, Dr. Sharon Wasoki, we're going to get you back, thank I you. hope, one day oh, and, so and get thank more uh, more from you. Uh, we'll get you back to China to get more food and we're going to get you back <laughs> here to the JES Digital Programming uh, to continue to talk about this because just as complex and rich as the country is, this was the presentation from you. We appreciate it, Dr. Sharon thank Wasoki. Thank you very much. Amazing. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And of course, thank to you all so of much. you all of you watching along at home, thank you for tuning in. Um, these programs and discussions and the exchange of information and ideas would not be possible without you. So a big thanks to you for tuning in. Uh, folks, for more information about uh, the JES, please visit jeserie.org. You're going to find videos of other past presentations available to stream on demand and publications, including reports, essays, timely writing, uh, as well as information about other JES initiatives, such as our Civic Leadership Academy and Ramey Fellows Program and programs where you can stream on demand. Uh, one note I'm gonna add in because I just saw it come in the comment section. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Sharon. Enjoyed this talk this afternoon, very thorough. Thank you for this valuable presentation. Another one that just came in, folks were getting those at the hot end of the program. So thank you, keep them coming. Uh, Dr. Sharon Wasoki, can't wait to have you back you. to talk more about thank your you. research, your findings. Uh, be sure to follow the Jefferson Educational Society on Facebook uh, and uh, Twitter and Instagram and subscribe to our YouTube channel where you'll find all these programs. Again, a big thanks to our audience. Big thanks to the doctor here for the Jefferson Educational Thank Society. You. I'm Ben Spagan. Be safe, be sound, and thanks for listening and learning with us. Thank you.